morning and welcome. We're glad you're here. It's fun to see people again. I haven't seen in a few, uh, few months. It, I think you folks have been on sabbatical or something. Uh, my sermon series is Living Right in a Wrong World, and just to make sure that God knew what my sermon series was, it just seemed to go wrong this morning. The internet was, didn't work. My sermon's on my phone. I can't print it out. Uh, I get a call from Clara. She's got COVID. Others got COVID. And, and we're looking and going, this is just too much fun. And yet, the scripture that I want to start worship with is the following. I thank my God every time I remember you. Constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for you all because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. Even this morning, people helping to work behind the scenes to try to get it to work. Todd being willing to pull out an offertory or an, to be able to play because the choir's not singing their anthem that they had selected. And uh, people, Joe Foster and others, Jim, we're all trying to make it work, Jackie, and I just want to say thank you because that's what's apparently been happening. You know, nothing happened when I went on sabbatical. <laughs> nothing. You know, very little changed. And, uh, you know, I didn't know we were doing a remodeling effort. Um, <laughs> but thank goodness for people and... Uh, People have just shared how you have gone over and beyond to try to help us. So thank you very much for all that you've done to help us during this time. We're going to make it through it. A uh, little bump in the road, but we'll make it through it. And thank you for all your help. Our mission statement defines who we are. We're Christ's disciples, celebrating God's grace, creating community, making a difference. And uh, so glad that uh, we're able to worship together, and it's our hope and prayer that you experience God's presence this day. We do believe everyone needs a church home and extended family to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. We appreciate folks watching us online, and if you wanted to register, that also would let us know who's here, so then it helps us know who's not here and we can reach out to. In fact, I know Jackie is firing up the Northwoods callers, I think, uh, to make a, a canvas call of all of our members because we want to connect with one another. And if you know of someone in need, please do let us know. Uh, the table starts up again today, and it's going to be a little more streamlined. We pray for a little patience because this is the first day back since uh, we've been doing it. And uh, this way we're going to, uh, people will be able to, um, enter and immediately get your food and go to your table. Uh, the cost is $10. Uh, we were losing money every time we uh, were doing it in the past, and so this way it covers it. Kids can eat for free, um, just not all 24 hours a day. And uh, so, but uh, we do want you to join us afterwards for some nice fellowship uh, and nourishment around the food, but also around the table as well. We're gearing up for our Earth Care Workshop, which is uh, coming up uh, in uh, September 21st. Have some great speakers in line. It's going to be a good time. How do we be good stewards of God's resources? That's what we're talking about. And uh, so we have some speakers to uh, inspire us and uh, challenge us and encourage us. And we also get to eat some good food. Uh, our very own Todd Noldy will be making uh, the breakfast, and uh, some of us on staff got to uh, a little preview of that. We're in good shape. You're not going to want to miss it, so sign up online to be part of our Earth Care Workshop. Uh, we also have our golf tournament coming up to support our youth ministry. Thank God for our youth. I heard that they were awesome uh, to help us uh, do some cleaning out over in the ELCP and some other things, so you can help support them by supporting the uh, golf tournament. If you play golf, you need to play in our golf tournament. So uh, sign up. Uh, I know Larry Fricky is back, and welcome, Larry. And uh, uh, we have a good, good team of people working to help support it. And so uh, we'd love for you to um, play in that that first Saturday in October. We also had to reschedule our VBS, and that's coming up, and sign-ups, and we're already gearing up and uh, need volunteers. And if you can help us out, please do let uh, Teresa know. And then also we wanted to say thank you for all the different ways that you've helped us uh, with our um, hurricane recovery and uh, appreciate all your help that you've done uh, for that. 
Uh, also, the, the generosity of many of you have given to help. You know, we didn't budget to take down 22 trees or whatever the number is or something like that. And uh, so we appreciate uh, gifts that have helped to offset some of that as well as we're still getting bids on um, helping us uh, make sure we make good permanent repairs. Uh, and then lastly, we wanted to say thank you to our ESL teachers. Uh, they start, started uh, off this last week, but you can read the names of the folks that, have, uh, that are helping us. And this is, again, uh, just another way to make a difference in the lives of people. met a woman from Algeria and was very excited to be in our uh, class, and I know that a number of people have benefited by uh, this wonderful ministry. So thank you all. Can we give a clap offering to God for all these folks that have helped out? So let us stand and begin by singing together all creatures of our God and King. <laughs>
What do you deserve? It's easy to expect certain things, to think that you've earned some rights. Maybe you think you deserve to play your game with no interruptions, or to stay at the front of the line since you got there first. Maybe you think you deserve to eat food you really like at dinner every day, or to get brand new shoes every time your old ones get a little worn. <laughs> Maybe you even think that since you're older, you deserve to go to bed late. <laughs> After all, every single ad you see on a screen or billboard or magazine screams, you deserve it. But when Jesus walked this earth, he showed us a different way. Over and over, Jesus laid down what he wanted for the sake of someone else. His time, his energy, his life. Every day, we have amazing opportunities to follow Jesus by putting others first. You can show your little sister she's important by setting aside your game to help her practice reading. You can put another kid first by letting them go ahead of you in line. You can put your mom first by not grumbling when she serves her favorite meal. And you could keep wearing your old shoes and give the money to a place that provides clothes for kids in need. And you can put your whole family first by going to bed on time so that you're not super grouchy in the morning. Jesus lived out every moment of his life putting others first. His love for us goes on and never ends. So you can say thank you to God by giving up what you think you deserve. When you put others first that way, others can see God at work in you. That's why humility is an amazing way to worship God with your life. Because worship is about more than just singing loud. It's all about living loud. Sunday school is starting. Children are invited to join their Sunday school teachers in the back for children's Sunday school in Grace Place. See you soon. Good morning, church family. Uh, Pastor Paul was talking about ESL earlier. This is our seventh year. Seven years ago, Ann Swisher and Melissa King decided to help put a program together to help people from all over the world speak English. The majority of the people that are in our ESL has been in country less than one year. So not only do they learn English, they also learn our customs. And they also develop some wonderful relationships, not only with each other, but also with our teachers. So if you ever want to try something different and, and want to meet people from around the world, uh, ESL is there for you, and we would love to have you. The song we're singing this morning is Mighty to Save, and that's what our Lord does. Because everyone needs compassion, and everybody fails so we need our lord there to help us we need to look to him because he's mighty to the save and that's the name of this song
Good morning, Northwoods. I'm Nancy Ingram here to discuss with you our upcoming Earth Care Workshop to be held on Saturday, September 21st, 8.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. As you know, this was originally scheduled for last May until the storm came along and knocked out our electricity. Our church has recently achieved the Earth Care Congregation designation. But what does this mean? And what are we doing that we can be good caretakers of the earth as God called us to be. Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. In Deuteronomy 11.12, God said, I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The mission of the Earth Care Workshop on September 21st is to bring us more information to carry out what we are called by God to do. What can we do to improve and extend the livability of God's planet Earth? As we pass this land from us to our children, to the grandchildren and further generations, knowledgeable speakers are lined up to bring us more information on how to carry this through. Adrian Shelley, Greening the Grid, Making Texas Electricity Reliable, Resilient, and Affordable. Since the winter storm of Uri three years ago, Texas leadership has taken some action to prevent another catastrophe, but there's been little progress towards making the grid more sustainable. Did you know that you can lower prices, increase reliability, and reduce air pollution all at the same time? Find out how as Adrian explains how to fix the grid. Deborah Caldwell speaking to us about sustainable gardening, protecting the earth. A retired college instructor of biology and environmental science, Deborah is a chair of the Harris County Master Gardener Speakers Bureau. She is a lifelong gardener with many years of experience growing ornamentals and vegetables. She is an elder for the New Hope Presbyterian Church in Katy, where she helps maintain their garden of grace. Jenna Armstrong Bridges, talking to us about recycling and are we doing it correctly? Jenna joined WN, that's Waste Management, as a public affairs specialist South Texas in 21, where she works to implement community education and promote WN's environmental stewardship and sustainability initiatives. Jenna holds a bachelor's degree from Stephen F. Austin. She lives in Klein with her husband, Hank, and their four children, ranging in ages from 10 to 14. Nancy Ingram Henman, I'm going to talk about clean air in the home. I've been a member here since 91, raised all three children here, and after my son Kyle, as an adult, developed severe multiple chemical sensitivities while fighting a debilitating mold toxicity, I have learned much about cleaning up air and removing toxic chemicals from inside my own home. Won't you please join us in our mission of learning more and accumulating more knowledge, Saturday, September 21st, 8.30 a.m. until noon in the Fellowship Hall. There will be a delicious breakfast served by our own Todd Nolte, and you know it's going to be good. Please sign up in the Narthex after church this Sunday or next or you can go online, www.northwoods.org, and click on the green 
Earth Care Workshop button. Thank you for listening. Will we see you there? I kind of felt God was really at work in all this because all those speakers that we had scheduled for the May uh, meeting were able to come back. So it, to me, it meant we were supposed to do it the way we're doing it. So I hope all of you will try to put it on your calendars and join us. Let us go to God in prayer. God of all compassion, in Jesus Christ, you have laid claim to our entire being and shown us that nothing is too grand or insignificant for your mercy to touch. Therefore, we are bold enough to lift our prayers to you this morning. From before the world's foundation, your love is the energy and source of our lives. We give you thanks for the goodness that overflows in our day-to-day -day living. Thank you, God of transitions, for the movement of the seasons. As we sense the shift from summer to autumn, we thank you for the gift of letting go and for reminding us that there's a season for everything. And just as we anticipate astonishment inspired by colorful leaves, we express gratitude for the respite and shade they've offered through the summer. We're grateful for shifting rhythms of our lives, for family, friends, and loved ones around us, for little ones and not so little ones returning to school, for the table and soccer and volleyball, for the return of our pastor and the time of rest that we'll have in the coming days. Yet all is not easy and straightforward, we know that. We ask for your healing and grace for those places that are broken in the world and in our lives, for nations plagued by war and souls plagued by shame. We pray for peace among the world's nations and commit ourselves to leveraging even our limited power for the well-being of all. We pray for the church's universal humility. We, may we each model that humility in our own lives. And may we advocate boldly for those who have been oppressed by deceptive forms of grace, for people without food or shelter and people without friendship. Help us to use our influence for your loved ones in hospitals, domestic violence shelters, and refugee camps. May we use our faith, O oh God, that it might bear fruit in the world. Send forth your church that we might care for people experiencing distress in so many different ways. We pray for the unhealthy practices wounding the environment. We ask that they be disrupted in favor of a harmonious and faithful relationship with nature as we once again become good stewards of the earth that you've entrusted to our care. We pray for the country and neighbors. Grant us vision to reimagine our considerable resources for the well-being of all. We know that collectively we make many mistakes as a body in your name. Where our churches and community ignore the cries and shouts of those longing for care, we pray for new directions, leading us to a world where all your children feel welcomed and cared for. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I have to tell you, I was uh, able to worship at a number of different churches while I was on sabbatical. And I have to say how great it is coming home and hearing some very gifted people help lead in worship. Welcome, Todd, back. Thank you for being here. Margaret, beautiful. We're very blessed to have such great musicians with the choir and the band and everybody, and it's just good to be back. Good to be back. Well, what do you think God thinks of religious people? Listen for God's word for you this morning. Jesus is, is involved. He, is, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we are grateful for your presence with us this day. And we don't want to just go through the motions, but actually believe that you have a word for each one of us. So free us from those things that may be clouding our minds so that we can hear your word tailor-made for us this day. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, today I am beginning this new sermon series, Living Right in a Wrong World. And I have to say, I have been excited about this sermon series because I just believe it is so applicable for us today. It seems like we are inundated with what's wrong with our world, our society, our politics, our country, our county, our city. The media makes a living on what's wrong in the world. And they're reimbursed if they can get you to watch them. So the more wrong, the better it is for them. Every morning we wake up and we hear these things. What a way to start the day. Mass shootings, drunk driving, robberies, war, all these things. And it's not like these are new things, but be, we hear them every half hour on the hour under the sup supposedly uh, the banner breaking news. So in this sermon series, we're going to look at some of these issues and factors that I believe will help us to live right instead of wrong. <laughs> we lived in such a polarized society, it seems that all of us think we're right and the other person's wrong. And I knew I was on the right track because I told one of our members this sermon series is Living Right in a Wrong World, and they said, why couldn't you have titled it Living Left in a Right World? <laughs> now be clear, this sermon series isn't going to fix everything. But I do believe it will help us look at what are some of the issues that we faced. Things that are difficult, especially problems. They don't get solved overnight. Talk to astronauts Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams. 
The two astronauts who thought they were going on an eight-day adventure is now turning into an eight-month adventure. And they're going to have to spend time possibly wearing other people's clothes because there's no washers in the space station. As a pastor, I've told you, I'm concerned about the divisions and polarization in our society. And I've told you that my concern now is it used to be faith informed our politics, but what I look and see is now faith or our politics are informing our faith. It's almost like politics are more important than faith. What's more important to you? Faith or your political party? And my question as a pastor is, what do we do about it? Do we just let society go? Or, like our great ends of the Presbyterian Church that I know you heard this summer, say we need to promote social righteousness. We need to be the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. We need to show the world a right way of living. Are we helping or are we hurting our situation? Let's take a closer look at our scripture this morning. This is Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. Jesus told his next story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down their noses at the common people. Then Jesus said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax man. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this, O oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid, like this tax man. I fast twice a week and tithe on all my income. Meanwhile, the tax man slumped in the shadows, his, hand, his face in his hands, not daring to look up, said, God, give mercy, forgive me, a sinner. Jesus commented, this taxman, not the other, went home made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. I love all the references to noses in this passage. Did you notice the reason why Jesus told this parable and to whom this parable is directed? Verse 9, he told his story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down their noses at the common people. The New Revised Standard says, Jesus told the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. The Greek word for contempt is a strong word. It means despise, set it not, contemptible, despise utterly, loathe, scorn, hate, deride, look down, ridicule, scoff, mock. Sounds a lot like cable news. On both sides. The reason why Jesus told this parable is he didn't like what he was seeing. He didn't like seeing people treat others with contempt, ridiculing, scorning, looking down on them. And let me be very clear about this point. Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the Word made flesh. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is not comfortable with the way the religious people were treating others during his time. Why are we comfortable? Jesus didn't like people despising, deriding, looking down. Jesus saw people who thought that they were self-righteous, 
and he decided to say something about it. As followers of Jesus, as people baptized into Jesus, as people who call themselves Christian, we too are called to be upset when we see people deriding others. It's one of the reasons why I think (laughs) the maximum we should watch our cable news media, no matter left or right, is one hour. You'll hear more about this next week's sermon. We're inundated with it. It fills us. It infuriates us to watch more. This past weekend, we had our children down from Waco. Waco. And uh, Jared brought his kids, and Debbie and the kids went over to uh, a thrift store to see if they could find some treasures. And uh, one of our grandchildren came back with cowboy boots. And it was a perfect opportunity for me to share one of my favorite stories about Jared when he was a child. And as you can imagine, the grandkids loved to hear stories about their parents when they were little. Well, when we left back in the uh, 1988 from California to come to Houston, which, by the way, my last line to Debbie when I was interviewing for the job was, don't worry, honey, we're not moving to Texas. (laughs) Well, as we left California, they they wanted me to be prepared. So they purchased me some cowboy boots so I would be fully equipped for my new job in Texas. Well, when we got to Houston, Jared was three and a half, four years old, and we needed to make sure that he was prepared for Texas, so we bought him cowboy boots. And boy, did he love his cowboy boots. He would run in them, play in them. I remember one evening, just to get him to go to sleep, we had to take his cowboy boots out and put them on his bed so he would actually go to sleep. He loved his cowboy boots. Well, we were having our first chili cook-off in Texas. And it was time for me to don my new cowboy boots. So I put my cowboy boots on and was walking to my door of my bedroom. And all of a sudden, Jared met me there. He looked up at me. He looked down at the cowboy boots. He looked up at me. He looked down at the cowboy boots. He looked up at me and he said, Dad, are those my cowboy boots? We see things only from our perspective. The Pharisee saw things only from his perspective and missed the bigger picture. We think we're always right. I know I'm right, right, honey? We need to broaden our horizon because the reality is What we see is only what we see. But there might be a bigger truth out there. One, I can't fit in Jared's cowboy boots. Jesus wanted to let the Pharisee, the religious person, know that being self-righteous wasn't part of what God intended. The Pharisee was confident of his moral superiority, boasting about fasting and tithing. But being self-righteous actually can be a barrier in our faith, in our relationship with God, and a barrier in our relationship with others. The tax collector, in stark contrast, stands at a distance, beats his chest, and cries out for God's mercy because he knows he's a sinner. The Bible's clear. All of us miss the mark. All of us are sinners. This is a powerful reminder that no matter how unjust or challenging our world is, our posture before God should dwell on his grace, on God's grace and mercy. 
Then Jesus concludes the lesson. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than uh, the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The tax collector was the righteous one, Jesus said, and the Pharisee was the one living wrong. In fact, that's exactly what Eugene Peterson, the way he said, Jesus commented, this tax man, not the other, went home made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. True righteousness comes from a heart that is sincere and aligned with God's values rather than an outward appearance or actions that seek to impress others. I believe one way that we can live right in a wrong world is to embrace humility more than self-righteousness. Jesus, the great physician, is prescribing humility to all of us. Our society needs more humility. In a world that often values status and achievements, we must remember that our worth is in what God thinks, not in our way to compare ourselves better than someone else, not to look down on others who happen to think differently about our world. Humility enables us to live genuinely in a world that we can live together and unite together. The Pharisee boasts about righteousness, and that's not the attitude we should have. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, a great person is always willing to be little. The Apostle Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility value others above yourselves. Confucius said, humility is the solid foundation of all virtues. So I decided to ask AI about humility and the world. Can humility help our world? Here's the response AI gave me. Humility can play a crucial role in addressing many of the problems facing society today by fostering more constructive and empathetic interactions, encouraging collaboration, and promoting a focus on the common good. Humility can reduce polarization. Humility encourages people to acknowledge they don't have all the answers, making them more open to listening to opposing viewpoints, creating space for compromise and collaboration. Encourage, humility can encourage innovation and collaboration. It fosters a collaborative spirit where individuals and organizations are willing to work together to solve complex problems as diverse perspectives and expertise are brought together. Listen to this one. Humility can improve leadership and governance. Humble leaders prioritize the needs of their constituents and the well-being of the community over personal ambition or power. This approach can lead to more ethical and effective governance as leaders focus on solving problems rather than advancing their own agendas. Humility can improve personal relationships. Humility allows individuals to admit when they are wrong, apologize, and seek reconciliation. This can help resolve conflicts more quickly and strengthen bonds between people. In essence, humility can act as a catalyst for positive change by fostering collaboration, ethical behavior, and a greater sense of responsibility towards others and the planet. One pastor put it this way, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. It's about serving others. That's why I have to tell you, yesterday was such an awesome day. 
everybody was there to serve others. Humility, giving up your own self and looking to the interests of others. Making 35,000 meals is awesome. Over the years, we've done that year after year after year, and you think of the impact that that can make. We had people distribute gifts to some of our folks that aren't able to be with us. What a nice reminder that says, you know what, although you can't be here on Sunday morning, we love you. And we care about you. We had quilters who were stitching quilts to literally wrap people with God's grace and love, especially those going through a difficult time. And we had children using their bright colors and stickers to write cards to our shut-ins so they got a little gift and a little joy with someone who cares. Service helps us see that our needs aren't the important, but others' needs. You know, sometimes there's others that we can blame for being, li- being in a wrong world, and sometimes that's life. How do you deal when your world goes wrong? What do you do? I'm married to someone who didn't like the way that the world was going for her dad. And in January of 2024, left home, left the dogs, probably loves them more, left the grandkids to take care of her dad 24-7. To become the executor of his estate, which that's a full-time job in itself. Until he died. Then, leading her brothers and sisters had to empty the house, get it ready to be put on the market, another full tilt job. Well, I know in her heart, especially Mr. Grandkids, she has no regrets about what she did, and her dad got the best care imaginable. Do not look to your own interests, but look to the interests of others. And as a loving congregation that I tell every week, you need a church home. People responded with notes of care. We received this card, thinking of you in your loss. Those we love are always with us. Their laughter, their wisdom, their thoughtfulness are gifts of love. They are ours to keep. May the gifts of your loved one help console you now and fill your heart with their comforting warmth, with deepest sympathy. It's from one of our church members who lost her dad. So I know it was from her heart. Friends, it's not always easy to live right in a wrong world. But I tell you, when we live it according to God's values, and we live it according to God's word, and we put other people's interests first, we have no regrets. Will you pray with me? Lord, help us to live right in your world. In your name we pray, amen. I don't want you down on, leave you on a downer. Our sabbatical, one of the most fun things seen, the joy come back to Debbie when she was with her grandkids. It was awesome. 
our affirmation of faith talks about this sort of way that we can live isn't the way that maybe society tells us but I believe it's a way for us to live let's stand and affirm what we believe together prayer of St. Francis let's say it together Lord make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred let me sow love where there is injury pardon where there is doubt faith where there is despair hope where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we're born to eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. How can you be an instrument of God's peace? God bless you as you give your morning tithes and offerings.
the table for our uh, gathering and fellowship as we're nourished by food and nourished by fellowship. Let us go out with these things. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.